Hello, my name is Simon Storz. I work at ETH in Zurich. And in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to present a cryogenic quantum network. You already see it on my title slide here. We have connected two dilution refrigerators through a cold quantum link. I'm going to show how we generate entanglement between two superconducting circuits located in different dilution refrigerators separated by a distance of several meters. But first, let's take a step back. So as we scale up quantum computers, a useful resource will likely be to connect different quantum processors to each other, to a network, as we know it from classical computers. So chip-to-chip -chip quantum communication is key for that. First experiments in this direction have been demonstrated by several groups doing quantum state transfer and generating entanglement between different chips. However, all of these experiments have so far only been done in single dilution refrigerators. But we think that it will be beneficial in the future to operate chips in separate dilution refrigerators. Because if we make more and more complex chips that require more and more control lines, at some point, it will become impractical to add even more cooling power to single dilution refrigerators. And we will also likely run into space constraints. Therefore, today, we present an alternative approach, which is quantum communication between cryostats, where the superconducting circuits are operated in different dilution refrigerators, but are connected through a dedicated quantum channel. So how should this quantum channel look like? First of all, we could transmit quantum information in the optical domain. However, our qubits and resonators operate in the microwave regime. So we need efficient microwave to optics conversion for that. There's lots of ongoing research in this direction. However, at the moment, the conversion efficiencies are not high enough to allow for high fidelity, long distance quantum communication between superconducting circuits. Therefore, we chose that our quantum channel should operate in the microwave regime. And we're going to use a waveguide, which has a similar loss as an optical fiber. Now, if you would connect two qubits to each other on a single chip, you would typically do that using a cold transmission line. Here, we use the same idea. We cool down this waveguide to millikelvin temperatures. And now this is a much more complex cryogenic system, as you can imagine, which should still be practical to use. So we still want to reach cool down times on the order of a few days, as we know it from standard dilution refrigerators. This we can achieve by optimizing the cryogenic aspects of the system. And last but not least, we want to have an extensible solution, which is based on different modules. So before I'm going to talk about quantum physics experiments that we did with our systems, let me show you the design of our quantum networks in a bit more detail. So many of you are familiar with the shielding concept of standard dilution refrigerators. For our cryogenic link, the concept is exactly the same. So here I'm showing you a cross section of this cryogenic link, and you can see that in both cases, we have a vacuum can on the outside and then different layers of radiation shields at different temperatures. And on the inside, for a dilution refrigerator, we cool a quantum processor. And for our cryogenic link, we cool a 3D aluminum waveguide, which is our quantum channel. And in the picture on the right-hand side, you see the actual cross-section with a vacuum can, copper radiation shields, and a waveguide in the middle. Let's also have a look at it from the side. So imagine you want to connect two dilution refrigerators together. With our scheme, what you do is you place individual link modules in between the cryostats. And if you want to bridge even larger distances, you just connect different link modules to each other. Let me also briefly state the main technical challenges of such a system. First of all, we want to maximize the conductive transport of heat along each stage because we have cooling power at the two nodes, but we want to cool down the full several meter long link. 
Furthermore, at the same time, we want to minimize the radiation heat load between the stages to keep the inner stages as cold as possible. And we also want to ensure that the full system is mechanically stable. And we also need to find ways to deal with mechanical contractions and expansions as the system cools down and warms up. In our laboratory at ETH in Zurich, we have realized two such cryogenic networks. Here I'm showing a 10 meter cryogenic network that connects the two dilution refrigerators here located at the two ends of this picture. You may now wonder what the temperature distribution looks like along this link. So here I'm showing the measured temperatures at each radiation shield, so each temperature stage along the 10 meter long link. And you see that there's a typical temperature profile. So the hottest spot is at the center of the link and the heat flows towards the two nodes where the cooling power is. This typical temperature profile can also be seen on the base stage uh, where we reach temperatures around 10 millikelvin at the two nodes and of around 20 millikelvin in the center. Let me also address the cooldown time. So we reach an operational state of our system, by which I mean 50 millikelvin at base after three and a half days of cooling. Now let me convince you that this type of system is compatible with microwave quantum communication. For that purpose, we built a second system, which is now for practical reasons a bit shorter. So this is a five meter cryogenic network that again connects the two dilution refrigerators seen here on the back of this picture. What we're going to do is to transfer quantum states between two chips located in the different dilution refrigerators using a scheme that we have published before. So we are going to place two nominally identical chips one into each dilution refrigerator. Each chip has a single Tanzmann qubit marked in red. It has a readout circuitry denoted in green here, and it has a transfer resonator in blue coupled to a Purcell filter. So what we're going to do is we're going to emit photons from the emitting node into this transfer resonator. We're going to send the photon through the quantum channel to the other node, and there we will reabsorb it to transfer quantum states. So let's have a closer look at how this works. This is our system. And let's for the moment only focus on the emitting node. And let's also forget about the readout circuitry at the moment. So then we end up with a single artificial atom, a Tanzmann qubit, coupled to this transfer resonator, which corresponds to the level diagram here. So if you now want to transfer the quantum state from this node to the other side of this quantum link. We first prepare the state that we want to transfer in the G subspace of the qubit. And then as a next step, we map it to the EF subspace of the qubit. Next, we apply a microwave drive at the F0 G1 transition of our system. This effectively transfers the excitation from the qubit into the transfer resonator. This you can also see on the plot on the right hand side. Here we measure the qubit population as a function of time while we drive a pulse at this F0 G1 transition. And if you look at the blue points, which is the ground state population of the qubit, you see that it rises while we, while we apply this pulse as the excitation from the qubit is being transferred into the resonator. Next, this photon in the resonator will decay into the quantum channel at rate kappa and it will travel to the other node. And there we can reabsorb the photon using the exact same scheme, just applied in a time reversed manner. And this time in the plot on the right hand side, we look at the receiving qubit. So imagine you send an excited state and the red points here show the population of the receiving qubit in time while we drive this pulse. And you see that uh, we recover an excited state population of 64%. The black lines underneath represent the master equation simulation, which tells us that this fidelity is mostly limited by photon loss inside the channel and by qubit decay and dephasing while we run this protocol. In a similar manner, we can also generate entanglement between the two qubits. We use the exact same scheme, just this time we essentially send half a photon 
And here I'm showing the results of a Cyplus Bell State tomography. The blue bars represent measurement data and the red outlines correspond to a master equation simulation. These are the polysets and you also see the GE density matrix of this Bell State. So we reach a Bell State fidelity of 76% corresponding to a concurrence of 0.68. So in summary, we have realized a cryogenic connection between two dilution refrigerators at the distance of five and 10 meters. And we have shown that our scheme is compatible with microwave quantum communication by doing deterministic state transfer and entanglement generation in such a system. As a next step, we could perform distributed quantum computing algorithms with our system, or we could increase the length to explore concepts of non-local physics and waveguide QED. So thanks a lot for your interest. And if you have comments or questions, we are happy to discuss them with you. So feel free to contact us.